Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode. Today, we've got a very exciting episode. Um, Somebody who you probably definitely know if you are caught up with Chelsea, if you have been up to date with Leon, um, you probably see him analyzing all of that fun stuff. Abdullah Abdullah is joining me here today to talk about, like I mentioned, all things Chelsea, their season so far. Abdullah, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me on. I'm very good. Very excited to talk to you today. Like I mentioned, Chelsea have had quite an interesting season so far. We're kind of approaching that midpoint. A few more games, two more games to go uh, for the rest of the year. And then obviously things kind of definitely speed up and rack up at the second half of the season with the Continental Cups also taking place. Um, I kind of wanted to start off with, I guess, with how they started the season. Obviously, there were a few, I guess, games that it looked like they needed to adjust on a few things. They had an interesting transfer window with a lot of strong players coming in. Not so many outgoings, um, obviously big names outgoings with uh, Ericsson and Harder, but they also had a pretty strong um, reinforcements. From how they started the few games of the season, um, even in the Champions League, were there any certain patterns that you picked up on that were of concern that you were like, hmm, it's going to be interesting to see how this plans out moving forward? Uh, you know, I, th- I think with the way the season started, I don't think there were too many things wrong about the team. I felt like the team started better than actually anybody expected because Chelsea, one of those teams that in, traditionally in the last couple of years have lost their or drawn and not basically not won their opening game. And then mm-hmm. suddenly when they win, you're like, whoa, that's there's your pattern. They they won a game instead of drawing or losing a game. Um. And I think from there, and it was a hard-fought win. It was Spurs at home, Stamford Bridge. It wasn't an easy game. Obviously, Martha Thomas made it uh, difficult towards the end, but Mm -hmm. it was a win nonetheless. And I think, if anything, I thought Chelsea went from strength to strength uh, in the attacking region with, with the players that were there. Um and 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 just kind of got a strength thing with the players that were, were combining together. Defensively, I felt like um Millie Bright obviously coming off a really good World Cup and she had a really good season. And I think she kind of took the mantle of you know replacing Magda as obviously captain, literally, and, and I think even in the back line mm-hmm. um really well. And I and I really feel like she slotted in. And I think the other biggest benefit has been that there are a lot of players that were probably who were squad rotation players last season who have now become first team regulars who have actually become really really good and I say for example Jess Carter has gone from being a very inconsistent player playing a fullback center back is she a Mm -hmm. left back is she a right back is she should be in this team to being Chelsea's second choice center back alongside Millie Bright and even for England now really being a regular in in that back line and Jess finally made that leap from being the inconsistent young player who came from Birmingham at 16, 17 to mm-hmm. finally now at you know our early 20s becoming the the player that we thought she would be. And yeah. so she's because she's peaked at the right time. Equally, Johanna Tinkanarid, uh, right wing, has suddenly transformed into like, oh wow, this is the player that we, we were supposed to buy. And and she uh has been consistent. I think she's been one of Chelsea's best attacking players going mm-hmm. going forward. Um where she's scoring goals, contributing, and actually making a difference in play. Whereas last season, it was, you know, she couldn't buy a goal to save her life to the point where she was getting goals cleared off the line. That was just heartbreaking. But, you know, when you have players like that coming through and doing well, it kind of it kind of boded well, but bode well for, the, for going forward and until the Arsenal game where we, where we saw them. Okay, I, th- I think that's a one-off we might talk about later. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think for me, I didn't really see any signs of, of anything being off. I think it was just more the new players have to gel together and and um, and before this team really clicks. And, and I think we're starting to see that slowly. How do you think those new players have gelled in um, with the likes of Ashley Lawrence, obviously getting consistent starts, consistent minutes? Um, her also Canadian teammate Jesse Fleming I think has used up uh, a lot of the opportunity of Wrighton probably being out I know they don't play the same position but obviously we saw the second that Guru Wrighton came back on starting it was Jesse Fleming dropping uh, on the bench it's I feel like there's kind of a relationship with whoever starts the other is probably going to be um, on the bench just because of the, the balance that I feel like Emma Hayes tries to have on the pitch but how have those new players gelled in? If Lawrence, if Nuskin can obviously get in that hat trick um, and a crucial win where they conceded a fair amount of goals, um, 
has it been the way that you've liked it, I think, or compared to previous seasons where you've seen the ingoings and outgoings maybe not be so adapted, adaptable so quickly? Yeah, I think I think if you look at the way um, you look at the way Chelsea have played, I think this season so far in all competitions, um, you've had a, a fair consistency across a number of starts. Mm-hmm. I think the problem with Chelsea last season for me was it was a very much a, a big reliance on the first team, and I think it's almost like Emma trusted. 13 14 players and then the rest were kind of like if i need to bring you in i'll bring you bring you in like you look mm-hmm. at it now um obviously jess Carlton and Eve charles have played have started played 12 started 12 games yeah. sam aaron johanna lauren shuka akb millie bright if paris sophie ingle all of these players have, have had seven or more starts and then you've got like a bunch of players who have had four or more starts as well. The only players who've really not had that many starts are Mia Fischel, Kadisha Buchanan, Gur Wrighton because of injury, Yelena Kankovic, Aggie Beaver Jones, and Melanie Leupold. And you're going to attribute half of them to injury mm-hmm. and maybe only Aggie to like, okay, young player came off the bench, but has come off the bench seven times and scored five goals. So mm-hmm. um, it's, it's, I think that the balance has been good in terms of the rotation. And I think you're right, just to kind of go on those new players. I think Ashley Lawrence has been a huge injection. I think she's she's needed a a, a, few, a couple of months to really just really adjust. But her quality of being that experienced player, I think, comes through from from minute one. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think she's done really well. I thought I think Shuk and Nuskin's really settled in. I think the first game was a little bit of nerves, but she's really settling in well and 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 really formed a, a quick partnership with Erin Casper. I think in midfield. So I think that's been a good thing to watch. Um, and kind of talking about. Uh, Jesse Fleming, yeah, I I, th- I think Jesse's played well this season. I think I think better than most seasons. I feel yeah. like she started better. She's performed better. I think she's found a home as this number ten. I can see her right behind your head on your on your on your right hand side right there. Always repping her. Uh, <laughs> always repping Jesse. Um, no, I think she's I think she's done well. And I, for me, I think she's really found a home in this number ten role. To me, she reminds me of. Uh, I always compare it in the, in the, to the men's Chelsea team is to Colin, Conor Gallagher, who mm. does kind of like this. He's the energy and the legs for the men's midfield. I feel like while well, they've got Aaron and Shuka who have the legs and they run around, but I feel like from a press perspective going forward and a bit of creativity, I think Jesse is really, really good. And my concern about Jesse was always, have we nailed out a position for her? Is she consistent enough in any of those positions? What's her best one? Because she has two great games, then two, three not so great games. But I feel like this season, she's done a lot better. And if you look at it, she's played 519 minutes, six starts, and kind of 11 matches played in total. So Mm -hmm. her contribution is like 90s on average. She's doing about 5.8, 6 90s per per average now, which is... Mm -hmm. Which is great. I, I feel yeah. like that that's just kind of showing consistency. And she's at the end of the day, she's 25 now, which again, I find really weird that she's 25. I thought she was like 22, 23, but she's 25. Yeah. And I think we're slowly getting into a territory where she's she's starting to really contribute and 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 do well. I mean, she already has four goal contributions, one goal, three assists. I think that mm-hmm. could definitely go up. But uh I, I think Jesse's definitely started uh better, uh, better than 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 I would than I thought so. No, I I think like you mentioned, it's her consistency has been maybe the main issue in last season, probably one of the the, the dips in terms of like the standard of Jesse Fleming. Um, didn't really get as many starts, um, as many minutes I think as she would have liked, and and I also think it, it had been hard to to nail her starts or like position that she actually wants to flourish in. So. Given that clearly a lot of the players have stepped up and a lot of the players, I think, have worked around injury. Um, if Millie Bright now injured and Guru Wrighton was out, um, Svitka, there's been a few players like in and out loopholes are back. But in the general sense, it's been a relatively healthy-ish squad. And I know we'll touch on Millie Bright a little bit. Do you think that Chelsea has worked around or adapted some of those injuries, particularly in the Arsenal game and the hacking game, which we'll touch on a little bit deeper in just a minute? Yeah, I think um, I think Chelsea have built a squad this season that I think fits the mold mm-hmm. of knowing that they're going to have to rotate and they were going to get injuries. I think after the injuries to Magdalena Eriksson, uh, Frank Kirby, Kadisha Buchanan, uh, Sam Kerr to an extent now, I think those key injuries, really, and even I think AKB as well, obviously last season with Zichir coming in, I think they've realized that 
they would more often than not want to have a deeper squad because some of these players or someone or the other is going to get injured at some point and rotation is going to play a factor because I think last season they played so many games and maybe mm-hmm. they underestimated the fact that they didn't have as big of a squad than they thought they would. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of us uh, in the summer were like, they're buying this player, they're buying this player, they're buying this player, but they're also keeping this player, but then they're overloaded in this position. We're like, how are you going to... like? Chelsea at one point had four goalkeepers on the books. I mean, they technically do, but they're at, at the club. And you're like, okay, fine, one will go. But then why are you keeping Hannah Hampton after you have AKB and Zichira and Hannah's sitting there going, yeah, okay, I'll stay. I'm sure there's a plan because between so. Zichira... <laughs> yeah, you'd like to think there's a plan. Um, between Zichira and um, AKB, they're getting consistent minutes. I mean, yep. AKB, seven, seven starts, seven games uh Zichira five games five starts so it's pretty equal in that obviously Hannah hasn't played yet but I think Hannah might come in for the Continental Cup games I think just to get that feel but mm. you look at it now Gur wrighton has been injured for about a month and a half so who comes into the into the into the four you have Johanna Britton Canada obviously stays and gets to play that also then means that someone like Aggie Beaver Jones can come in now and get some more minutes because she she's coming to the side You've had injuries to Millie Bright. That means Kadisha and Marin can start playing a little bit more. You can drop in Shuka Nuskin if you want to. Midfield, mm-hmm. you've had the the odd injury here and there. Aaron hasn't been fit for the start of the season. So yeah. you have Sophie Ingle. You have Shuka Nuskin who came in. You have Melanie Leupels again. Melanie Leupels another one who's been injured and I think is low-key. I think it'll be, been a big miss for Chelsea in that midfield. I really mm-hmm. think that she can bring something that, 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 that we're probably missing a little bit. Uh, Jesse Fleming can play there. The fullback's important. Ashley and Eve kind of coming in there and kind of giving Chelsea quality. Hmm. Neve Charles has stepped up as becoming Chelsea's number one left yeah. back. Um, Svetkova, unfortunately, we can't even count. She basically has never played. Like so, disappeared in the realm. Yeah, she's like disappeared into the nether realm. She's a ghost somewhere. She's chilling in the yeah. back. Uh, Anik yeah. Nao is another center back at the club. Obviously did her ACL. ACL. But she was there. Helena Kankovic is another one that's been injured. But again, she's around for depth. So mm-hmm. these players that we've just listed, like Frank Kirby hasn't played as many games as we thought, which is because of injury. But she's uh, healthy. Kind of taking... She's healthy, which, which is, is great. So the fact yeah. that she can come in now and like a start a game like last night and just be mm. like, okay, we need a we need a good competent number to okay, a friend, mm-hmm. you can start. You know, like you have that option. And yeah. when Sam hasn't been playing, you've got me official coming in and playing those minutes. So Chelsea realized, oh, we need almost two per position and they've got enough rotation in there in that side in the squad to be able to maneuver things around and still keep it and i think already so early in the season i mean halfway through the season you've Mm. realized that okay you needed all these players because every single one of them bar anik nawa who played one game for five minutes Mm. everybody else has played minutes and and is either played less minutes because of injury or is just consistently playing, yeah. uh, playing games. So yeah, I, th- I think this, I think Chelsea yeah. have done decently well to navigate that. I think actually, uh, I'm glad you highlight squad depth and a lot of the players get a minutes because I feel like this is what you actually see towards the end of the season when bodies are being limited and everybody's picking up a knock. But they've actually gone through this at the start of the season. And I think they've handled it pretty well. Until, I guess, they come up against Arsenal at the Emirates. It's a record crowd um, for the WSL. Um, Arsenal coming in. Uh, I guess there was, uh, th- th- that was definitely their best performance of the season. So they had something to prove out of the Champions League. Um, you've got to take your opportunity. And uh, in the words of Emma Hayes, they got bullied and they got assaulted by Arsenal. Now, I think from a press perspective, Arsenal's pressing was spawn um absolutely executed it to the t did what they need were massively aggressive do you think that chelsea was it a i guess the narrative here is it that arsenal just had that good of a day or was it also that chelsea just had a very very bad day at the same time i want to say it's a little bit of both but i think Mm -hmm. i will give it to arsenal just just being really really good i think i thought i think i thought arsenal just they just outplayed um I'll play Chelsea that day. I think they were just quicker to everything. One place where I genuinely thought that Chelsea would dominate Arsenal was in midfield because I didn't think Palova, uh, Kim Little, and um, Leah Volti would 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 be able to match the energy of Shukaniskin, Aaron Cuthbert, and 
obviously at the time, whoever whoever was going to play at number 10 hmm. um, for Chelsea. And at the end of the day, they just kind of went. I thought Palova, I mean, I know Alessia Russo got, got player of the match, but I thought Palova was the best player on the pitch for them. She was incredible in that midfield role. Uh, and Chelsea were just second, second, second best to everything. And Emma Hayes admitted as much. Uh, so I, I think it was more so that Arsenal had a really good day and they were really clinical. And they just cooked Chelsea that day, which kind of yeah. hate to say it, but when they've played that well, you really have no choice but to say, fair enough, Arsenal better team on the day, mm-hmm. and uh, they got what they deserved. They got a four one win at home in front of a big crowd, so fair enough. Um, I think there was a fair amount of criticism, not only in the midfield of losing most of the duels, um, being second to the ball always, but also AKB had a little bit of, um, I guess, and even Emma Hay said that. Adrian Kittenberger should have probably not come out the way she did for that um, header that was scored um, from Amanda Elishtet. Uh, I didn't think this was actually going to be a narrative where we're like, oh, maybe Chelsea are not coming up with the best decision who on who should be on goal, given who they have on the roster to who can be in goal. Was it a bit of a mistake to have Ant- Katrin Berger kind of step in for that game. Um, should it have been Musevich moving forward? Is there a clear number one in goal or is it kind of still up in the air? And that's okay. I, I think there's always too much pressure to like name a number one and maybe we don't need to have a number one specifically. But for that game, do you think maybe Musevich should have been the one to step up? And I think just highlighting for the starting 11, Lawrence wasn't starting. I feel like when she was introduced, there was a lot of that stability kind of gained by her. Buchanan, obviously, she gets really close to the defender. You were kind of, or sorry, the, the attacker or the opposition. You were kind of expecting to see that from her. We saw that from her. So the reinforcements and the substitutions that Hayes made, uh, I think, stabilized things for the most part. Um, so was the starting 11 nailed on? Was there a question in, in, in the goalkeeping between the sticks? How did you evaluate that? Um... I don't think, I mean, I, th- I think Chelsea, I mean, Emma Hayes has done this thing where she's brought in Zachira, played a few games, then suddenly AKB comes back, plays a few games, and there's been a lot of this chop and changing goal, and I think both players have played enough with the back line that you can kind of bring in either or, and it wouldn't make too much of a difference to the back line because they know exactly how both of them play. Um I still think that AKB is the better shot stopper than Zachira, though maybe Zachira might be a little bit better uh in 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 maybe claiming uh crosses and maybe being a little bit more aggressive i think mm. i think akb is just a better goalkeeper in terms of shot stopping and maybe just kind of ant- anticipating uh, shots um so i don't think it was i don't think it was a too big of a mistake to bring mm. in akb i think that's fine I, I i think there will be this constant rotation and every time we've seen akb have a game like this she has bounced back and produced world class performances in 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 games that do matter so yeah. once in a while if this does happen it's fine i mean you find out now that she didn't play the hacking game because she went down with the flu so mm-hmm. it could just be that you know that that remnants and the start of the the the, the illness was kicking in during the Arsenal game, which might, I mean, I'm clutching at straws for excuses here, but like <laughs> uh, it, could, it could be a reason why it wasn't there. But no, the goal where she came out was was a mistake. I don't, she should never have, with the crowd of players in front, let them deal with it. Why do you have to come up off your line? Yeah. Um, which you don't expect from a 31-year-old experienced goalkeeper like that. But it is what it is. It happens, and I and I and I feel like um, it's one of those games where Chelsea just need to move on and 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 kind of go 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 next and be like, all right, cool, we're still ahead. We just need to maintain our our distance and and just make sure that we win every game from here on out. Yeah, it's it's a must win game. I think that the league is so tight and it only continues to get tighter. Um, obviously, Arsenal and Chelsea both level on points. The only thing separating them is goal difference. But talking about bouncing back and needing to score goals midweek. Um, they hosted BK, BK Hacken, which Hacken defended brilliantly for the 95 plus one or two minutes um, and held Chelsea to a goalless straw. They got the point. They're still top of their table in the Champions League, which is crazy. You probably would have never scripted the fact that Hacken would be top of the table with Real Madrid and Chelsea. Um I think it would be useless to touch actually on the first Real Madrid game because we know how that draw came upon. And I think the refereeing would just take any good evaluation of the game but looking at that game that they just had last night obviously it was an issue of being clinical 
um, there was some passes, I guess, patterns of passing that was a bit sloppy. Now, sloppy passing and not being clinical in front of goal is not something that we typically associate with Chelsea. I feel like they are they punish you when they're in front of goal. And all they need sometimes are a few counterattacks and then they're up ahead. Like that's what Chelsea sometimes most definitely are known for. Again, is that of concern? Is it just kind of not picking themselves up just yet from the Arsenal game? They sit pretty comfortably in that in that group and, and I think I'd have my money on them going through. But what was it for you that just didn't click so well for them um, and f- for Hacken and just to mention Falk in goal for Hacken had an incredible game as well? Um, you know, it's weird. It's, it's, they've got such a big overperformance in this group stage that you look at the thing. I think they have something like a minus six G or, I mean, expected goals against. And you're like, you shouldn't, you should be on zero points with like a minus eight goal difference. And yet you are top points and like, you've scored like three goals. Like how, how can have done this? I don't understand. There's a point now where that's going to stop because it's just luck that they've done this to some extent. And you don't going to get that much. Like Chelsea, any other day, win that game 3-0. The Aaron Cuthbert shot goes in, you're 1-0 up. Sam Kerr's goal doesn't get ruled off offside, that's 2-0. And then the confidence on that, they would have built out to, to get some more. Um, so I, I think I think you play that game again, and I think Chelsea comfortably win that game. It's... Interesting how this group is going to go because I think um, with Paris FC winning their game against Real Madrid, they now have the confidence to go up against uh, you know Hacken twice and go. Do we can beat you? And I th- I actually have a feeling that I think Paris will take four points off those the double header against Hacken. Wow! Because Real Madrid now have like one point. They've just lost. Yeah. They've drawn one, lost one. Arguably, they should have lost the first one as well. So they should be on zero, actually. Um, and Just tearing them apart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, 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 okay, yes, they also have an incentive to go through because if they can pick up two wins, they yeah. can, you know, they can do well. But I really feel like they, um, I really feel like it's it's going to be tough for Hacking now because they have to play Chelsea away from home, uh, at mm-hmm. home, sorry. And Chelsea will come back with a vengeance. They're playing Bristol on Sunday, so which means Chelsea should get a good, comfortable win on Sunday, get a bit of confidence yeah. back, go to Hacken, knowing they have to win that game. So I think Chelsea will turn up when it really matters. They will turn up. Mm-hmm. They win that game. Suddenly, Chelsea are on five, six, eight points. Hacken is still on seven. They drop to second. Assuming Paris win their game against Real Madrid uh, again, or even get a draw, suddenly they're on four points or six points, and then suddenly the group gets super interesting because then they go to Hacken and they do it. So <laughs> there's just there's just this narrative and thing building yeah. that, that the whole the whole group could flip just from the, the games next week. So mm-hmm. I think I think we'll wait and see, but I think Chelsea will turn up. I think I don't think Hacken goes through. I think it's Paris along with them. Uh uh-huh. out of nowhere. I always predicted Paris to go through second. So I'm just gonna stick with my with my prediction, but um, it'll be an interesting group for so. But I think Chelsea will show up, and I think they'll they'll take the group comfortably because they're comfortably the best team in the group, but that without a shadow of a doubt. Mm-hmm. I mean, that group it's it's going to be a lot of surprises, and I think again it's going to be a very cold night in Sweden next week, actually. So not only do they need to turn up, but you definitely need to use all your Scandinavian Canadian players because they can do it in the cold. Um, but on that game, I kind of want to touch on the fact that they hosted at Stanford Bridge, obviously that game, and they capped their um, audience or sorry fans in the stadium to five thousand. And I don't think this was planned very well, but they also had their camera in front of that crowd. So the camera actually filming everything was just looking at empty seats because everybody was behind the camera. So I was watching and I was kind of getting feels of like COVID almost where the stadiums (laughs) were closed, which is not a great look, um, especially coming off the weekend with Arsenal having 59 something thousand in their stadium. Like that's exactly what we need. This is the second time that Chelsea have capped their 5,000 people in the stadium. We know it's massively, hugely expensive to host at these big stadiums. Why do we think Chelsea are not kind of pushing it and I guess risking it a little bit more and trying to campaign a little bit better for those games at home in the Champions League where they can probably definitely get more than 5,000 people into the stadium? 
So this is an interesting, uh, interesting point. Obviously, Chelsea made uh, something on their website uh, the uh, the back end of November, I think, in their first or second Champions League game, that where they said, you know, um, we do appreciate that midweek evening matches can be challenging for some fans, and in order to maintain the club's commitment to sustainable growth, mm. we Stamford Bridge will will hold a reserves a reduced seating of five thousand people. I then we 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 have a little bit of a group chat, and we we were talking, and apparently some, one of our uh, one of our co-hosts on the, on the podcast that we're on said she spoke, they spoke to um, the head of commercial and they basically said that, look, Chelsea, you know, Chelsea never, wa- no, Chelsea had to do it because if anything goes over 5,000, they have to pay triple the amount to UEFA to host a game. So it, it really comes down to commercials mm. saying that. It's, and also at the same time, the tickets were also really, really expensive. So increasing the capacity having to pay more of a fee to UEFA for, for having more people watch the game with the ticket prices being so high it, for Chelsea just made no sense. And I, and I believe that they're playing in, 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 in the champ in the, in Stamford bridge, because I think there's UEFA regulations that require certain aspects of a stadium to be there, uh, which Kings Meadow doesn't apparently meet. So they have to play at Stamford bridge. Um, because so let's just say even if they didn't want to, which I think Emma Hayes has been vocal about wanting to play at Kings Meadow more than playing at Stamford Bridge because they're so used to that smaller crowd and mm-hmm. um, having three thousand fans there who are really on you and for you, I think it's better than five thousand in a much bigger uh, yeah. area. Um, they kind of don't have a choice. I think I think they have to play over there. So until until that's fixed, so I think I think that kind of was more of a forced hand than anything else. However. You look at the Arsenal, like you talk about Arsenal having 59,000 fans. I just feel like, I think with Arsenal having a little bit more of a, I don't want to say have history, because they, I mean, they do, and I don't think the Chelsea don't. Chelsea have, Chelsea have been a very good football team for the last 10 years or so. But I think Arsenal, you know, mid-2000s, early 2010s, they were yep. really that team that were winning leagues, titles, and mm-hmm. and I think they brought the community together. And Arsenal have always looked, seemed to be like this one club, the original one club, where the men and women seem kind of always integrated. They've had some big players for England, yeah. you know, Alex Scott's of the world, etc. And so I think they kind of grew that base from there before it really became a thing. Yeah. And Chelsea have been doing that in the last five to seven years. So we're now seeing yeah. slow remnants of the Chelsea men and women, you almost look at it going, okay, cool. It's all very aligned. It's all very together. You see pictures of like Emma Hayes and sometimes mm-hmm. it's Potch or Graham or whoever the head coach is for Chelsea's men's team, always integrating together and having lunches and you hear stories like that. So mm. that's happening now. Um, and so I just think with Arsenal, their fan base has just been a lot more um, established a little bit in terms of the men and women's team coming together and um i I guess maybe it comes down to a little bit more of the uh marketing which i believe the new ownership group wants to change and kind of bring things forward and change the business strategy Mm -hmm. but so maybe we'll start seeing the 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 effects of that in the next season or two but yeah i think with austin i think it's just been the right moves at the right time the right moves at the right time uh that is what chelsea will be looking to do against hacken next week and definitely for the rest of the games of the season unfortunately we're going short a little bit on time here but i know you talk chelsea very very regularly you are cooking something for chelsea behind the scenes so tell us about how folks can listen to the pods that you're usually on which i'll be definitely leaving a link down below and everything that people can be following you where how just kind of give them the rundown Oh man, where do I start? No, I'm joking. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a regular I'm a regular on the uh, Londoners Blue podcast dedicated to the Chelsea men and women's teams. We have our own show called Blue Royalty. Uh, so I'm I'm there at least once a week, if not twice. Um, do a lot of freelance writing for different outlets. The Equalizer, if people in North America kind of maybe heard of them, uh, Analytics FC, ESPN, wherever someone wants me to write something about women's football, I'm there doing tactical work. So I've got a lot of uh, old archive stuff on my Substack called Pressing Matters. And uh, if that's not enough, if we want to read any books, then I've got those goes written around somewhere around the world. So yes. uh, different teams, different things. So yeah, kind of all over the place. I'll be leaving all the links down below for the podcast, some of his work, his Twitter, um, and the books all in the description. So if you're not up to date with things, then you're definitely missing out. Abdullah, thank you so much for joining me today. And hopefully we'll we'll catch up when Chelsea could be lifting a trophy by the end of the season. (laughs) Hopefully so. Yeah, I'll definitely be back. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thank you.